So we're beginning the portion of MR, literally say or speak. And it's called the MR because of the opening statement, which is Hashem tells Moshe to speak to Aaron, his brother. I'm sorry, to speak to the priests who are Aaron's children. And we have many laws in the beginning of the parsha that pertain specifically to the priests, um, primarily the fact that they have to separate from ritual impurity. And we also have limitations on who they can marry. So it's really about the laws of the Kohanim of the priests. And then you have other that, that's followed with, with other laws about the offerings and about further laws of the priests eating the gifts. In other words, eating portions of the gifts that were given to them by the Israelites or the, or, or the flesh of the animals, of the sacrif sacrificial animals. And that's pretty much the first half of the Parsha. And the first half of the Parsha is really, is really consistent with most of the book up to this point. The third book is referred to by the Medrash as Torah Kohanim, the laws, the, the law of the priests, because a lot of the book pertains to sacrifices and offerings. And this seems to fit the model. Um, um, this seems to fit the model. And then you have a little bit more interpretation where additional, like I said, ad additional laws about the priests. And then the um, Torah shifts. In the fourth reading, the story shifts. And now no longer do we talk about the people, the priests, or the, that pertains to them. Rather, we, we shift the topic. So somebody just asked, the Kohen, the priesthood follows the father, not the mother. So if my father was a priest, I would be a priest. I'm not a priest, but I am not happen to not be one. My mother happens to be a Levite. Her father was a Levite, but I'm not a Levite. Um, part of that, part of that, part of that is this week's parsha, if I'm not mistaken, is... Um, in biblical times, the daughter of a Kohen could eat the truma, could eat the gifts of produce until she is married. Once she's married, if she's married to a Kohen, she could continue. Um, but, but if she marries an Israelite, she could no longer eat the flesh of the offering. Yeah, that's in this week's Parsha. If you have the art scrolls, page 679, but uh, chapter 22. Um, verse 12. Okay, so what did we shift to? Now we shift from the theme of the priests, we shift, and, and, and again, laws about the temple, we shift to talking about the holidays. The second half of the Parsha, from the fourth reading till the end, is about the holidays. And the holidays seems to be a completely different theme. And what's the connection? So what's the connection? So some people read the book and say, I guess, in the beginning of the Parsha, we talk, the beginning of the book, a lot of the book is about the priests, about people. Holiness within people, how to be holy, how to be ritually pure, et cetera, et cetera. And finally, we get to this parsha, the, the purity of the Kohanim, the priests, the additional restrictions and obligations that come along with their, with their sanctity that they have to do to maintain their spiritual sanctity. Okay. But after that, we go, we move from the dimension of the person to the dimension of time, right? We mentioned that last week, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, the week before, that in the um, the Kabbalah, the book of Yetzirah, the book of formation, talks about the three dimensions of really time, space, observer. In the language of the book of formation, it's Olam Shana Nefesh, world, which is space. Shana, year, which is time. And Nefesh is the soul, is the person seeing it. So you have, we discussed the person, now we discuss the dimension of time. And it's the time of the holidays. Um, the holidays is the time with how time is sanctified. And if you stick around for next week, you'll also learn that not only is time sanctified, but also space is sanctified. And that's next week's Parsha, where we talk about really the next two Parshas. We talked about the sanctity of the land of Israel expressed through the mitzvah of Shemitah, the sabbatical year, where we have to let the land rest um, once in seven years. And then the next Parsha, which is all about the rebuke, is also connected to the sanctity of Israel because the Torah explains that uh, the, uh, the primary, one of the primary reasons for the, for the, exile is because the people would not, it, 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 as a result of the people not keeping Shemitah, the sabbatical year. So we move from the holiness of the person to the holiness of time in this parsha, and then to the holiness of space next parsha. 
So that would be sort of, if you're looking for a pattern between in the, in the third book, because there's so many themes and so many details, people like to think of general patterns. So that would be a possible general pattern to think about. So that's the introduction to the introduction. Now we can, now we're just about ready to read the Parsha in a nutshell, and then we can start getting into the specifics of this beautiful and wonderful Parsha. So here we go, we see we share the screen. Emor in a nutshell, the Torah section of Emor speaks, begins with the special laws pertaining to the Kohanim, the priests, the Kohen Gadol, the high priests, and the temple service. A Kohen may not become ritually impure through contact with a dead body, save on the occasion of a death of a close relative. The Torah defines close relatives. There are seven relatives that the Kohen could become impure. Um, to deal with their body, to go to the funeral, etc. A Kohen may not marry a divorcee or a woman with a promiscuous past. A Kohen Gadol, a high priest, can marry only a virgin. A Kohen with a physical deformity cannot serve in the holy temple, nor can a deformed animal be brought as an offering. A newborn calf, lamb, or kid must be left with its mother for seven days before being eligible for an offering. One may not slaughter an animal and its offsprings on the same day. So this is very interesting. There's a parallel between an, offer, an animal being offering to God. You have to wait till the eighth day. That may remind you of something of the circumcision on the eighth day. So in other words, there's something about the eighth day that initiates the holiness. Uh, the second half of the uh, second part of Emor lists the annual callings of holiness. Mikrai Kaidish, callings of holiness. What is the callings of holiness? The festivals of the Jewish calendar. The weekly Shabbat, the bringing of the Passover offering on the 14th of Nisan, the seven-day Passover festival beginning on the 15th of Nisan, the bringing of the Omer offering from the first barley harvest on the second day of Passover, and the commencement on that, on that day of the 49-day counting of the Omer, culminating in the festival of Shavuot on the 50th day. Then we have a remembrance of shofar blowing on the 1st of Tishrei, which is Rosh Hashanah, a solemn fast day on the 10th of Tishrei, the Sukkot festival, during which we are to dwell in huts for seven days and take the four kinds, beginning on the 15th of Tishrei, and immediately following ho the holiday of the eighth day, Sukkot Shmini Atzeret. Next, the Torah discusses the lighting of the menorah in the temple and the showbread lechem apanim placed weekly on the, on the table here, on the table there. Emor concludes with an incident of a man executed for blasphemy and the penalties of murder, death, and for injuring one's fellow or destroying his property, which is monetary compensation in the case of destroying property. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is the story in short. Uh, if anybody wants to comment on anything we read or anything you heard so far or anything you want is it piqued your interest, please do. Otherwise, we will um, begin the journey and see where, see, where, see, where, see, where, see where we go. Okay, let's begin somewhere. Where should we begin? Go ahead, Vicky. Well, if you don't mind, can we start from the beginning? Because uh, either, either translation or something kind of unclear about uh, who Cohen cannot contaminate himself, about the sister, but especially about the sister. Okay, so we'll read, we'll read the verse inside. In short, this, um, um, the Cohen cannot become impure to mother, could become impure, I'm sorry. Mother, father, son, daughter, brother, unmarried sister. In other words, once the, once the sister is married, then it is sort of, she has the husband to take care of her. And that's sort of, she sort of goes to the other, considered part of the other family and therefore, and therefore the Kohen cannot become to his, um, um, impure to his sister. And then there's another thing that doesn't say explicitly, but the sages say, that of course it includes a spouse as well. And they use it, I'll show you which, which verse they derive it from, we'll do that in a moment. Um, says, let's find the part we uh, partial text. Here we go. 
And the Lord said to Moses, speak to the Kohen and the sons of Aaron and say to them, let none of you defile himself for a dead person among his, pe among his people, except for his relative who was close to him. His mother, his father, his son, his daughter, his brother, and for his virgin sister who was close to him, who has not yet been with who, who was not yet with the man, for her he shall defile himself. Um, now, so you counted six, but I mentioned there are seven because the sages learn that in verse number two, the sages derive that verse number two, when it says, um, except for his relative who is close to him, could be read relative who is closest to him, the sages say, oh, that's a wife, that spouse. So if you look at number two, look at the Rashi and number two, um, except for his relative, the expression she'ero, his relative, refers only here to his wife. So it's interesting that usually in the Torah, the term she'er -e could be used as a relative, but it can also be used specifically for a wife. And that's what Rashi says. That's why we have seven. Um, It also says the sister who is close to him. Oh, so here what Rashi, what Rashi says in number three, who was close to him, this expression is to include the sister who was betrothed but not yet married. In other words, in the halacha, there's two stages of the marriage. There's engagement, betrothal, with, but legally betrothal makes the woman marry to her husband. It just marriage cannot be consummated until there was a chuppah, until there's the second stage of the marriage, which is, which is the chuppah. But in the ancient world, in the old days, they would do it as two separate occasions. So you had about a year where the woman was legally married, but not yet living with the husband. So like at that point, if they want to separate, they need a divorce because the, the betrothal is, 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 a, is a real connection, halachically. Today, we don't do that. Today, what we do is under the chuppah, we do both ceremonies. Under the chuppah, we do betrothal and marriage. So we don't, because we don't, not looking for extra complications. So the Rashi tells you that the verse could have, could have just said his virgin sister who, who, who has not yet been with the man or whatever, he, could be, he shall defile himself. Why do you have to say who was close to him? What does it mean? Does it mean I'm, I'm talking on ter talking terms with my sister? So Rashi says, no. Rashi means that even if she's betrothed, which you may argue maybe at that point, um, you cannot become impure to your sister. He says, no. Um, she's still close to you. She's not married yet. She's still close to you. You still have the opportunity and therefore the obligation to um, to become impure to that person, to, to, the, to that uh, to that betrothed sister, even though she's not even even though she's betrothed. So in some sense, she's married. But because the mar marriage was not completed, um, she's still considered close to you. One more point on this is the first verse is very interesting. Let none of you defile himself or a dead person among his people. What does it mean among his people? Be'amav, amongst his people. So here there's a beautiful Rashi, beautiful teaching of the sages. Sages say like this. The sages are going to tell us that there's something called a met mitzvah, literally a dead who is a mitzvah. And that is a dead person who does not have any relatives to take care of the needs of the dead person, the burial, etc. So the debt, it's called the met mitzvah. Sometimes the met mitzvah could be because he's living in a city and doesn't have any relatives. Sometimes it could be because someone just dies in the field and no one knows who he is. Says Rashi, quoting the sages, that a priest who is not allowed to become impure must become impure to take care of the needs of a dead person who has nobody else to take care of them. And that's what they interpret. They interpret when the verse says, let none of you defile himself for a dead person among his people means if a dead person is among his people, amongst other people who could take care of him. But if a dead person is not amongst his people, he's what we call a met mitzvah, a dead of the mitzvah, then the Kohen has to become impure, sacrifice his own spiritual purity, and um, take care of the needs of another person, which is absolutely fascinating. So let's read the Rashi inside. Let none of you defile himself or a dead person among his people. Says Rashi, what does it mean among his people? While the dead person is among his people and therefore has people, non kohanim to bury him. This comes to exclude from the prohibition a kohen who comes across a met mitzvah, a dead person for whom 
no one is calling it, no one is in calling distance to attend to his burial, and thus is incumbent for people to attend to him. And this comes from Torah Karnim, which is the Medrash on, on, the, on the book of Leviticus. So that's beautiful. In the same sort of sentence, when the Torah is telling us, introducing the idea of a priest, and a priest has to be separated from impurity. And a priest has to make sure that not to become impure for anybody, except with very few exceptions. But if it is a metz mitzvah, somebody else needs um, to be buried, then the other person's need comes before the Kohen's um, luxury right your 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 other person's necessity should come before the coin's luxury and this is true not only for a priest but for a high priest as well which a high priest is even more interesting because a high priest is not allowed to become pure for anybody not even a close relative not only not even parent or child never allowed to become impure except met mitzvah if there's some somebody that nobody nobody else is there to take care of the dead person the high priest must defile his holiness and become impure. So that's fascinating that the, that that my own spiritual luxury cannot come in the place of the other person's necessity. Go ahead, Dr. Ken. Um, thank you for taking the uh, uh, the question. Um, my question is how how do you define come near? That's an excellent question. So for that, you have to look at the laws of impurity. Um, in short, biblically speaking, the way you become impure for somebody is touching touching the body. Um, transporting, carrying the body. So even if I don't touch the body, but I carry the bed, but I'm moving, I'm moving the body, that would be uh, impurity. And then the most, the most, um, the most uh, uh, common one is a person, a priest is not, if you're under the same roof as the dead person, that conveys impurity. So the priest is not allowed to be under the same roof as a dead person. That's called tumat ohel, the impurity of a tent. And uh, that has all kinds of ramifications. It's not so simple for a Kohen, for a priest to go into a hospital if the hospital has a morgue, um, unless it's, of course, life-saving, but it's not a simple matter. And there are all kinds of, uh, all kinds of other, other uh, complications. A funny one is in Israel at some point, because they started moving the, the, moving the airplanes <laughs> over a big cemetery when they when you fly out of Israel. And that became a question because not only that getting into the details, not only you can't be under the same roof as the dead person, but you can't become a tent over the dead person. You cannot, in other words, not that you can't, you would technically, if I lean over a dead person, I am the covering, I'm the tent, so I become impure. So now the question was, does the airplane flying over the cemetery, does that bring the impurity? So without getting into how to solve that problem, um, that's the most common one, the tent, either under the same tent of a dead person or leaning over a dead person and I become the tent. So there are all kinds of laws and all kinds of things that the priests and the Kohenim have to be careful about. Now, it's not actually, it's not so terrible. Now, if the priest, okay, I don't want to say it this way. Right now, if the priest becomes impure, he violates a commandment. But in the biblical times, if I become impure and I go into the temple, that's much more severe. It's not just a regular commandment. That's a, that's a very, very harsh commandment. So the point is that in those days, the priests would be very careful about not becoming contact with dead people. And even today, priests do the same. In other words, Jewish priests, which is fascinating. Why is it fascinating? Because when you go and look at other cultures, you see the opposite. You see that uh, next time you drive by a church, tell me if you, what do you see? And a lot of times you would see a cemetery right outside the church. I know in Greenwich, a few, a few places do that. Um, in the temple, God forbid to have a cemetery next to the temple, you cannot become next to the temple if you went to a cemetery. Uh, there, was not, there was no burying dead people in Jerusalem. Uh, probably the oldest Jewish cemetery is Mount Olives, Har Hazetim. Mount Olives is outside the border of Jerusalem. Okay, why is that? So there are all kinds of there's interesting uh, theories, but uh, some say that, well, the idea here is that the priest tells you how to live. Many religions tell you how to die. In other words, the, the religion is here to tell you how to become more spiritual, how to become closer to God. So ultimately, the, the path is how to, how to get to the point where the body is outside the soul. So when you're in this world, you have to be in this world, but ultimately the vision is, oh, we can't wait to get to the point where uh, our soul reunites with God. 
Okay, so ultimately, the priest, in some sense, the priest is telling you how to become more spiritual, how to become, how to go to heaven. Okay, so next to the next, it's the next to the house of worship. You have to have a funeral. But the, in Judaism, of course, we believe in the afterlife, but that's not the emphasis. The emphasis is to fulfill God's purpose in the creation of this world. So what is the priest? The priest is about life. The priest is about bringing the holiness of God into this world. And therefore, the, the, the concept of death, the separation of body and soul, nothing wrong with that. I mean, that's the way of the world, and that's fine. But that's the antithesis of the job of the priest. Because the job of the priest is, could you bring sanctity into the physical? Death represents the departure between the physical and the spiritual. So it's a, completely, it's a completely different view of what the job of the priest is and what the job of spirituality is. That's one interpretation, but there are other interpretations. And that is that ultimately death brings to sadness. When a person faces death or sees death, ultimately they bring that, what that leads to is facing my own mortality. In some sense, that's a sense of sadness. There's no place for sadness in the service of God. Even though there's sadness is a human emotion, but when you come before God, it's a joyous experience. And therefore we have to separate not only the dead, but anyone who came in contact with dead. Because when I go to, the, when I take care of the dead, there's trauma. And even if I don't sense it, there's a subconscious sadness that sets upon me. And if I'm gonna to go to the temple, I need to be separate from that. So that is another interpretation. Again, there are various, various forms, uh, forms of explaining this. Okay, let's move a little bit. I mean, we talk about, uh, we, 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 uh, this parsha is a very beautiful parsha because we talk about it um, every year during the parsha, but it also covers the holidays. So we cover some of these themes during the holidays. But just to think a little bit about, if we talked about how this parsha, I mentioned that this parsha is really the power of the, the, the uh, emphasizes the holiness of time, the holidays. But the beginning of the parsha is the holiness of the people, of the priests. So where is the shift? So it's a very interesting phenomenon. And that is that the holidays actually, what they do is they emphasize the holiness of the Jewish people. And this is a very important point here. Why is it so important? Because there's a very big difference between Shabbat and all the holidays, even though there's a problem, which we'll get to, is that Shabbat is listed amongst the holidays, but you'll see in a minute, Shabbat and the holidays are completely different in the sense that Shabbat, the holiness of Shabbat is in the language of the Talmud is created um, by, by itself. Makad Shavakaima, it's holy, it's holy and it stands by itself. We don't, we don't make Shabbat holy. If the people didn't do anything, Shabbat would still be holy. In fact, Shabbat is holy, not because of anything to do with the people. Shabbat is holy because of what God did. God created the world in six days. And on the seventh day, he rested, right? So it's God's initiation. God designates it as holy. When it comes to the holidays, however, the exact opposite is true. The holidays are created, are established, not by God, but by the people. And that's written explicitly in this week's parsha. But it's not just a, a word in this week's parsha. There is a whole body of law that grows out of this notion. And that is that the Jewish calendar um, was designed and established, was supposed to be in a way that it is established based on the sighting of the moon. So in other words, you have to have two people come to the court, say we saw the new moon, and only then does the court question them to make sure they're saying the truth. And only then does the court declare that that is indeed a holiday. And if the court doesn't see it and delays it, the next day is the holiday. In other words, the next day is day one. And the holidays are based on the days of the month. And the months are based on the first day of the month. And the first day of the month is based on the declaration of the priest, of the, of the court, of the people. So ultimately, it's the people that establish the holidays, which is very different than Shabbat. And the question is, what is, the, what is the significance of that? And what is the mystical significance of that? But before that, we want to look at, the, at, at what is the verse saying, what the practical application is. Well, maybe we'll look at a story of the Talmud to help make the point, but there's a lot to discuss. So um, let's start the journey. So here's the verse. I'm going to share the screen. We're going to the fourth reading of this week's, of this week's portion in the portion of Emor, Leviticus chapter 23. Okay, Leviticus chapter 23. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, 
speak to the children of Israel and say to them, the Lord's appointed holy days, Moadei Hashem. So the word Moed is a tricky word. Moed can mean a time, appointed time. Moed can also mean a meeting. Ohel Moed, the tent of meeting, right? So when you make a meeting, um, at least my Google Calendar wants to know what where is it taking place, right? So you have the time you put in the put in the block on your calendar. That's time, but also where. Today you could put in Zoom, so you solve the problem. You don't have to worry about a place. But my Google Calendar sort of has a location built in, location feature built in. It will tell you where the location is. You put in the address. It will tell you how to map it. So in other words, a meeting has to have a time and place. If I say, yeah, let's go on a date. What time? Next Tuesday. Where are we going? I don't know. We're not going to meet up. Or if I say, let's go out to pizza, but we forgot to tell you what time, we're not going to meet up, right? So moed is a tricky word. Again, I, we always say in Hebrew, time and space are related in the same, in the language here too. Moed could be time, moed can be meeting in a certain space. Okay, but what's the, what's, what, what are we trying to get at? The Lord's appointed holy days that you shall designate as holy occasions. Asher tikru'u otam. You shall call them. That's what literally what the word, say, word says. You shall designate them. You shall call them um, kodesh, um, holy occasions. Literally callings of holiness. These are my, my, my holy days. And you continue to verse 4. These are the Lord's appointed holy days, holy occasions, which you shall designate in their appointed time. You shall call them in their appointed time. And that's why the sages learn that it's not, a, it's not the, the, the new month does not come into effect until the court sanctifies it and say, this is Rosh Chodesh. And if there's no, if, 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 and, and what they Yom Kippur is, or what they Rosh Hashanah is, or what they Sukkot is, all the holidays are based on the days of the month. So basically the determining factor of who has the power to decide what day is Rosh Hashanah or any other day, any other holiday, it's actually the people, which is very powerful. And the point here is, um, the point here is that we're talking about a relationship with God and a relationship by definition has to be not just one way, not just one partner is dominant. Not just the parent does everything for the child. That's a, that's a very immature relationship. I know such people who have relationships. First of all, I have a daughter who's six months old. It's totally one way. Um, there's no reciprocation, but that's not a mature relationship. A mature relationship is that both parties are invested. So Shabbat is where God creates the holiness. Holidays is where we set the holiness. And God says, when is the holiday? Ask the people. And the fascinating ramifications of, the, of, of this laws, uh, even before we go to the mystical end, and I just want to share one story from the Mishnah. Uh, you may have heard the story. In short, there was a debate between the sages of when, whether or not this, this day was the first of the month. And the minority opinion thought it wasn't. And basically, at some point, what was the question is, what day is Yom Kippur? And of course, Yom Kippur, the holiest day of the Jewish calendar. So you got to get it right. And you'll see here a fascinating story where the leader of the majority forces the minority opinion to come on Yom Kippur to his home to violate the holiday by walking with his money and his walking stick, et cetera, to prove that he's accepting the opinion of the majority. Because you can't have two Yom Kippurs amongst the Jewish people, the people with the, the, the nation would fall apart. And then we see how, how, the, how the other rabbis react to this. There's a fascinating piece of the Mishnah. We'll read it inside, and then we'll see, uh, we'll see if, we can, if we can add some insights. So here we go. Um, Okay, so this is Tractate Rosh Hashanah. Tractate Rosh Hashanah addresses, amongst other things, the laws of sanctification of the new moon. So I don't want to get into the details of the question that was at stake, but we'll read it. We'll see what happens. Mishnah. There was an incident in which two witnesses came to testify about the new moon. In other words, in other words that like, as we mentioned, you have to have witnesses come to testify that the new moon appeared. And if the new moon appears, that's how we know that it's day one of the month because it's a 29, the moon has a 29 and a half day cycle of, around the earth. And toward the end, the last day or two, you can't see the moon. And then when the moon is reborn, um, you see the moon again, that's day one. So two witnesses come and testify and they say, we saw the waning moon in the morning in the east. In other words, last month's moon waning, we saw it in the east. And then they say, um, and the same day we saw the new moon in the evening in the west. 
That's what they report. Now, the sages were not, not just passive and accepting their testimony, but the sages, through their calculations, which we have today and we use today, which is fascinating, um, they can actually predict when and where the moon will be appeared. So you can't, you can't really trick them. So Rabbi Yochanan ben Nuri said they are false witnesses, as it is impossible to see the new moon so soon after the last sighting of the waning moon. However, when they arrived in Yavne, which was the center of Jewish, Jewish, um, Jewish scholarship after the destruction of the temple, when they arrived in Yavne, Rabbi Gamliel accepted them as witnesses without concern. So you're just seeing stories where there were differences of opinion of whether or not these witnesses are indeed uh, valid. Let's continue. And there was another incident in which two witnesses came and said, we saw the new moon at its anticipated time, i.e. on the night of the 30th day of the previous month. However, on the following night, night i.e. the start of the 31st, which is often the, on the, the determinant of a full 30-day month, it was not seen. And nevertheless, Rabbi Gamliel accepted their testimony and established a new moon on the 30th day. So the, the thing is, the moon is, will either appear on the 30th day or the 30, 31st day. So here the witnesses come and say, 30th day we saw the moon, which means the 30th day is really day one of the next month. The problem is they say the next night we went outside, it was a clear night, there was no moon. Rabbi Gamliel had no problem accepting that. Rabbi Dosa ben Arkinas disagreed and said they are false witnesses. And here's a funny expression. How can witnesses testify that a woman gave birth and the next day her belly is between her teeth? I.e., she is obviously still pregnant. In other words, you're telling me that there was a new moon, and I see the next night there's no moon. Obviously, you're not saying the truth. You can't, your testimony can't disagree with the, with the fact, with reality. How could it not be seen a day later? Rabbi Yeshua said to him, I see the logic of your statements. The new moon must be established a day later. So now we have a dispute. We have Rabbi Gamaliel who accepted these witnesses. We have Rabbi Yeshua who says they're not, that, that, that they didn't accept the testimony. And if you don't accept the testimony, if you haven't seen it on day 30, then day 31 becomes day one because the moon, it's going to be either one of those two days. So the bottom line is two great sages, Rabbi Yeshua and Rabbi Gamaliel disagree about when day one is. And there's a lot at stake. What's at stake in a minute? You'll see Yom Kippur is at stake. Rabbi Gamaliel, upon hearing that Rabbi Yeshua has challenged his ruling, Rabbi Gamaliel sent a message to him. Rabbi Gamliel sends a message to Rabbi Yeshua. He says, I decree against you that you must appear before me with your staff and with your money on the day on which Yom Kippur occur occurs according to your calculation. According to my calculation, the day of the 11th of Tishrei, the day after Yom Kippur, right? So he says, Rabbi Gamliel says, Yom Kippur, the month started a day early. So Yom Kippur is a day early. Rabbi Yeshua says, no, the month starts a day later. So he says, Yom Kippur is a day later. So Rabbi Gamliel, who's the head of the court, says you, the thing that you think is Yom Kippur is really after Yom Kippur. So I decree that you come to court with your walking stick, with your money, which is a violation, and come on Yom Kippur. Now, what are you going to do? What is he going to do? He doesn't know what to do. The, the court is forcing me to violate my Yom Kippur. So let's see what Rabbi Akiva, his friend, told him and consoled him. And what he did is he quoted this week's parsha, And that's why we're getting into this. Rabbi Akiva went and found Rabbi Yeshua distress, distressed. Right? Of course he's distressed. He's going to have to violate his own Yom Kippur. Impossible. That the head of the, San, of the great Sanhedrin was forcing him to desecrate the day that he maintained was Yom Kippur. In an attempt to console him, Rabbi Akiva said to Rabbi Yeshua, I can learn from a verse that everything that Rabbi Gamliel did in sanctifying the month is done, i.e. it is valid. As it is stated, and he quotes the verse of this week's parsha, our, the verse we just read, as it is stated, these are the appointed seasons of the Lord, sacred convocations, which you shall proclaim them in their season. Leviticus 23.4. The verse indicates that whether you are proclaiming them at their proper time or whether you have declared them not at their proper time, I have only these festivals as established by the representatives of the Jewish people. The verse says, Ashetikru Oisam. These are the holy convocations that you will call. You shall proclaim. Says Rabbi Akiva, God, if God, let's say God knows the truth. Let's say God knows that Rabbi Yeshua is right. The minority opinion is right. That Yom Kippur is a day later. But God says, I'm sorry, I outsourced it. When is the meeting? The meeting is when the people call the meeting. And therefore he says, Yom Kippur is when Rabbi Gamliel, the court, when the court proclaims it. So that's the story. We really, we can stand, end here, but the story gets better. So I'm going to continue reading. Now he was very, obviously very troubled. So Rabbi Akiva's words from this week's parsha did not console him because he says, yeah, you're supposed to listen to the court. But what about the, this court? I'm not sure the people of this court uh, know what they're doing, right? Everyone agrees you have, to, you have to agree with the Supreme Court. 
Um, but when the, you don't like the people on the Supreme Court, you say, not these judges, these guys don't know what they're doing. So that's what happens. So now Rabbi Yeshua, who's still distressed after what Rabbi Akiva told him, came to Rabbi Dosa ben Harkinas, another sage, who sent him, if we come to debate the question of the ruling of the court of Rabbi Gamliel, we must debate and question the ruling of every court that has stood from the days of Moses until now. In other words, you, if you're not going to disagree with Moshe, you can't disagree with any court. If you disagree with, it, with any court, you have to disagree with Moshe. Again, it doesn't mean you can't disagree, but it means you have to listen to them. What verse does he, does he quote to support that point? As it is stated, then Moses went up and Aaron, Nadav and Avil, and 70 of the elders of Israel. This is describing the giving of a Torah where Moses, Aaron, Aaron's two sons, Nadav and Avil, and 70 of the elders go up onto the mountain, not to the same place, but they all come closest to the Mount Sinai. So that what, what, what Rabbi Adosa says is, look, the Torah equates, uh, the Torah specifies Moshe, Aaron, Nadav, and Aviyu. Why doesn't the Torah tells, uh, tell us these fascinating 70 people? Who were the 70 people that went up to the mountain? Right? It's curious. You want to know who were the, the, the people who signed the Declaration of Independence? It's interesting. Why can't the Torah tell us the names of these 70 people? So Rabbi Adosa says, no, we can't tell you those names. Because if we tell you those names, you're going to say, I only have to hear, listen to a court that is as great as those 70 people. So we keep them anonymous, meaning it doesn't matter who they were. What matters is their position. In other words, the institution, not the individual. So the institution of the court is what you have to accept. And therefore, that regardless of the, of the members of the court in your generation, even if you're smarter than them, as we will see, he was smarter than them, you have to accept the, 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 uh, the opinion of the institution. So here we go. But why were the names of these 70 elders not specified? Rather, this comes to teach that every set of three judges that stands as a court over the Jewish people has the same status as the court of Moses, since it is not revealed who sat on that court. Apparently, is it enough that they were officially, official judges in the Jewish courts? The end of the story is most fascinating. I mean, Yeshua, who is the minority opinion, who's being forced to violate his own Yom Kippur, Rabbi Yeshua heard that even Rabbi Dosa ben Arkinas maintained that they must submit to Rabbi Gamliel's decision. In other words, Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi Dosa ben Arkinas was the first person, first person who said that statement. How could you, how could you testify that someone is, gave birth if she's still pregnant? In other words, so he was the opinion. He actually swayed Rabbi Yeshua to agree with him, but without getting into the details, the bottom line is he says, okay, I got to listen. I got to accept. So he took his staff and his money in his hand and went to Yavne to Rabbi Gamliel on the day on which Yom Kippur occurred according to his own calculation. Upon seeing him, Rabbi Gamliel stood up and kissed him on his head. This is beautiful. He said to him, come in peace, my teacher and my student. You are my teacher in wisdom, as Rabbi Yeshua was wiser than anyone else in his generation. And you are my student, as you accepted my statement, despite your disagreements. So in other words, he didn't say, you have to listen to me because I'm smarter. No, you're smarter. But we're the majority. <laughs> no, we're the institution. You have to respect the, the court, and therefore you have to accept the resolution of the court. So this is the story. Why did I bring this to you? I really brought, brought it to you for what Rabbi Akiva says. Rabbi Akiva says, this is the meeting, right? These are the appointed seasons of the Lord, sacred convocations, which you shall proclaim in their season. This indicates that whether you have proclaimed them at their proper time or whether you have declared them not at their proper time, I, meaning God, I have only these festivals. God has, God says, when is the meeting? The meeting is when you call the, when you call the dates and you call the meeting. And that's what happens, and that's, and that's the understanding of what happens between, um, that's how the Jewish calendar is set. And again, it's very different than the Shabbat. Okay. What are some of the practical ramifications of this? The practical ramifications of this is, to, just to be clear, that at a certain point in history, about 1,500 years ago, maybe a little bit more, about 1,600 years ago, they had to change the system because, because there was no more court. The high court was disbanding, and there was persecution against the court. So the Hillel, one of the sages, not Hillel of the Mishnah, but, but, but uh, great, great, great grandchild, Hillel um, established a calendar and we follow that calendar. And the calendar is basically follows the calculation of the moon and we can predict for the next thousand years and more, actually forever, uh, we can predict exactly what day the new moon would appear at any given time. It's not so complicated to do. Maimonides has 19 chapters on it. He says any school child could do this in two, three days. Okay, I don't know about me, but any school child could do it. It's not that complicated to, to, to figure out when it's going to be. Okay, um, so we shifted back. Now, this explains the notion of the fact that Israel and outside of Israel have two separate, uh, have, have, different, have, have a different way of celebrating the holidays. Outside of Israel, we have an extra day. 
Why do we have an extra day? So Passover begins on the 15th of Nisan. Outside of Israel, so you're not supposed to, so let's say for Passover as an example, you're not supposed to do uh, is seven days of the holiday. You're not supposed to do work on day one and day seven. The problem outside of Israel, instead of seven days, we do eight days. And we don't do work on day one and two, and we don't do work on day seven and eight. So basically we're doubling, we're adding an extra day because, uh, to every holiday. The reason why we do it is because in ancient times, before this calendar was set, there was a doubt which day is the holiday. Why so? Because you can establish, you, the, the place that the court was, the place that the new moon was established was in Jerusalem, in the temple, in the court that was in the temple. Then you have to, it's a race against the clock. You have 15 days minus two days because two of the, you're going to have two Shabbatot where you can't travel. You have 15 days, of, so you have 13 days to notify the community through sending letters. There were no texts, there's no TikTok back then. So you have to actually send messengers to the various communities to inform them what day the holiday is. The problem is that outside of Israel, the messengers would not come in time. So in any given month, Today, could it, day, day one could either be the 30th day of the previous month or the 31st of the previous month. So it was always a doubt. So outside of Israel, the people kept two days because one was a doubt. Now, even today, but in Israel, they, didn't, they just kept one day because they, they knew what day the holiday was. Even today, once we have the calendar, we, there still is a rabbinic decree that we, that we celebrate two days. Why? Not because we're in doubt, because we have the custom of our ancestors. Because outside of Israel, in the diaspora, the Jewish people have always kept two days. So we keep that in place and we celebrate two days of the holiday. That's a little bit of the history. Um, now you know why when you go to Israel, you only have to do seven days of, of, of Passover, for example. You only have one say there. You only have, you don't do work day one and day seven. You have more days to vacation to, to do work. Um, Outside of Israel, it's doubled. You don't do work day one and two. You don't do work day seven and day eight, as we mentioned. Okay. What are the, so, so, so how do we think about this? How do we think about this issue that um, we have a different holidays than the land of Israel? Slightly different. So the first interesting point I want to say is the fact The fact that there was no, in biblical times, there was no set time for the holiday makes life a little complicated, right? Because, well, you can plan your season, you can plan for the seasons based on the, on the sun, but you can't really plan the holidays because the holidays are tied into the moon. So if I say, oh, next year Passover, let's go to, uh, let's go to Hawaii. Okay, when is next year Passover? We don't know, right? So you can't really make plans until the last minute. In other words, you don't really know what day the Seder is till the last minute. So there's a certain suspense in the air. Why is that? Why can't the Torah just say, do what we do today, figure out, calculate when the new moon will be seen? It's not very complicated. It's 29 and a half days. Um, I'll give you the exact number, Um 29 days, 29 and a half days, and Tafshin Sadikimo. and 793 portions of an hour. I forgot exactly how many portions the hour has, but we know, exact, we know exactly when the new moon will appear. It's not a big deal. So why can't the Torah just says make a calendar? Why do you have to cite the moon and then declare and then you may get it wrong and then there may be a disagreement when the holiday is. So this spot, the, the fact that it's spontaneous is built into the process. Why is that? So the commentaries explain that's the whole point. The whole point is it's not set. It's God is saying, I can't make plans. I'm dependent on the people. The fact that it's not set in stone represents the power of the Jewish people. The holiday is really set up and given to them to declare when God is going to show up to the meeting. So the fact that it's not set in stone is actually highlights the power of the people. So now, if you think about that, once the, the calendar was set up in Israel, we lose that element because now it's predictable, so it's not spontaneous, so you don't see that it's that God is showing up because we called him. By the way, when Mashiach comes, this, the high court will be reestablished. We go back to the old system of citing the moon, of, of sanctifying the time, setting up the calendar by the citation of the moon. But what turns out is that outside of Israel, the fact that we have two days reminds us 
of the doubt that once existed and the doubt that once existed actually celebrates the power of the people. So in some sense, the people outside of Israel are more plugged into this notion that the Jewish people are the ones who sanctify the holiday even more than the Jews in Israel. So that's a certain advantage to being outside of Israel regarding the holidays. That's what the commentaries explain, at least some of them. Okay, let's put that aside. Maybe, maybe, maybe it was too detailed, but let's go a little further. How do we think about this notion that, let's say, Passover. And if you're in Israel, you only do one Seder. If you're outside of Israel, you do two Seders. Why is that? Why do we have more than them? Why do they have less than us? What is, like, how am I supposed to think about this? So generally, if you look from the lens of the Hasidic, of Hasidic interpretation, there are generally two ways to think about it. One way to think about it is that we, outside of Israel, have a disadvantage. In other words, in other words, to put it like this, there's a certain level of holiness that one could achieve or awareness or holiness that one could achieve during the holiday. If you're in Israel, it only takes you 24 hours to achieve that. If you're outside of Israel, where the holiness is not so pronounced, it's harder to feel connected to, connected to God. It's harder to generate inspiration. So there you need 48 hours to do what it would take in Israel 24 hours. So case in point for Passover, to feel the sense of freedom in Israel, one Seder is enough. Outside of Israel, because we're in a more of a spiritual darkness, we need that additional help. We need that second day or that second Seder to be able to generate and get to the same point that the Jewish people in Israel could achieve in one day. So looking from that perspective, looking from that perspective, we, the Jewish pe people outside of Israel, are at a disadvantage. And we have to work double the effort to get to the same point. That's one interpretation. But then you have a Hasidic interpretation that says, uh, Hasidic interpretation, everything has to be uh, uh, the opposite in the sense that you'll see in a minute that uh, uh, the distance, the darkness is really uh, a great opportunity for growth. And therefore what, 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 what the Hasidic comment, uh, commentary adds, I mean, just to be precise, the first commentary is from Rabbi Shneir Zalman, the founder of the Hasidic movement. He says, look, why do we have two days? Because we have to work double as hard to get to the same place where in Israel they get to in one day. Okay, that was, that was the Rabbi Shneir Zalman in the Kodit Torah. The Rebbe said like this, the Rebbe said one, one year, the Rebbe quoted what Rabbi Shneir Zalman said, and he said there's a deeper meaning. What's the deeper meaning? The deeper meaning is, why do we have a double holiday? Because we get double the joy. In other words, we actually have much more holiness and much more joy than the people in Israel. How so? How could you say that? How could you say that we in Israel, outside of Israel, have a greater spiritual advantage than the people in Israel? Isn't Israel the land of the Holy Land? So here, this is so Hasidic, here the Rebbe says like this, when a person is distant from holiness and then has an opportunity to connect to holiness because he was distant, so now the joy that you get from coming back from a distant place is much more increased. Right? The metaphor is if a person wasn't so thirsty and you have a cup of water, okay, you drink a cup of water, you're happy that you have the water, but you're not that joyous. But what happens if you're in a desert, you're in a parched land, a place without water? That creates a tremendous longing and yearning. And when you get that cup of water, you're double as happy. And therefore, the people in Israel who don't experience that same level of darkness, so the holiday is a nice thing, it's a nice thing, it's a holiday, it's an upgrade, you have more, inter you have more connection to holiness. But because we're more distant throughout the year, because we're outside of Israel, we're more distant. So when it finally comes a moment where we sense a connection to God during the holidays, here our joy is doubled. And because our joy is doubled, the holiday is doubled. In other words, in the final analysis, there's an advantage to the person who was distant and comes close, which is the, which is the, the Jewish people in diaspora during the holiday, where we were distant because we're in a place that is un, not as holy. But then we come back to God during the holiday so we come back with more intense joy than the people who were in Israel, which means they, they, they were always in a place that was a little bit more holy. So again, just a little bit of, just to repeat what we said quickly in, the, in 30 seconds, at least three ways to looking at the second day of holiday. One day, the advantage of the second day of the holiday, which now is only a doubt, yes, but it reminds us of the true system where the setting of the holidays must be spontaneous because that represents that the people are the ones who do it. And that's an advantage that we have outside of Israel because, because we celebrate the two days to commemorate the time that there was doubt. 
really what we're doing is we're commemorating the time where there was um, um, where, where, where it was set um, by the Jewish people. And then you could say, well, the next, next level is that the reason why we have two days and Israel has one day is because they have, um, they have the help from the holiness of Israel. So we have to work double as hard to get to the same place of joy and holiness that they get to. And then you can get to the Rebbe's interpretation is no, because we're distant, that's why when the holiday comes around, we're much more joyous and we, we're therefore drawn to God with the greater joy, greater enthusiasm and greater longing. And therefore we actually come out ahead, but not because there's more holiness outside of Israel to the contrary, because there's less holiness. That's why the joy that comes in during the holiday is double, increased in a double fashion. So that is just to say a little bit about the celeb, who calls the shots, who calls the days uh, of the holidays. So that's a little bit of that. I'll be I'll make a confession. It wasn't supposed to take 55 minutes, but it did. So that's what it is. But at least you got a good story, a story of the Mishnah of Rabbi Eliezer and Rabbi Yeshua. Now I want to say one more thing about the holidays. I don't remember if I said it in the past, but it's interesting. We talk about the holidays in the Jewish people, in the Jewish, in the Jewish, in, in, uh, on a Jewish calendar. And you say each holiday, what does the holiday represent? And you will find that there's actually two themes. And at least on the surface, these, tombs, these themes are not only different themes, but they're in some sense, they actually may be classified as contradictory themes. Okay, where do you see this? So let's open up the screen and let's look, read a few verses in the four minutes that remain. Um, In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, in this afternoon, you shall, you, shall, you shall sacrifice the Passover offering for the Lord. On the 15th day of that month, at the festival of the unleavened cakes, in Hebrew, matzot. It's the holiday of matzot. When I tell you matzah, what do you think of matzah? Matzah is, of course, the exodus. We celebrate the exodus. Wonderful. However, right after the exodus, right after Passover, after the first day, the Torah starts telling us about the Omer. Basically, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come to the land that I'm giving you and you reap its harvest, you shall bring to the Kohen an Omer of the beginning of the, your, your reaping. Passover also celebrates the harvest. Let's keep going. Um, we count the seven days. What is um, Shavuos after seven, after seven weeks? Again, after seven weeks, the 50th day, from your dwelling places, you shall bring bread, set aside two loaves made from two tenths of an ephah. They shall be of fine flour and they shall be baked leavened. The first offering to the Lord. The first bread is offered to God on Shavuot. I spoke about this yesterday, but on the second day of Passover, they offered the first offering of barley. Seven weeks later, they offered the first offering of wheat. Okay, so we have that's an agriculture theme. And we have more mitzvot of the agriculture in verse 22, leaving the gifts of, of agriculture to the poor. Then we continue and we talk about Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, no agriculture there. Then we go to Sukkot. What happens on Sukkot? Uh, you build the sukkah. Why do we sit in the sukkah? Because God placed us in the desert, um, and placed us in huts in the desert when we left Egypt. Okay, so that's agriculture. I'm sorry, that's reminding us of the Exodus. And then look at 39. But on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you gather in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the festival of the Lord for, seven, for a seven-day for a seven period. What are we celebrating? We're celebrating the ingathering of the harvest. In other words, if you notice the pattern here, there is two cycles that we celebrate, and they all happen on the same time. On one hand, we have the cycle of agriculture. Passover is the time of Aviv, spring, where the grain begins to ripen. It's almost ripened, the beginning of the ripening. Then you have the celebration of the harvest on Shavuot. And then on Sukkot, you have the ingathering. You finish bringing in all the produce of the whole of the, from the previous year. You put it out, you put some out to dry during the summer. At the end of the summer, everything is in your storehouse, ready for the winter. So you make a Chag HaSif, a celebration of the ingathering. The bottom line is it's an agricultural cycle. And this is not new to Judaism. Most, most agricultural cycles, if not every single one, has agricultural holidays, celebrating the power of nature, celebrating the earth, celebrating the fertility of the earth. Nothing unique about that. 
Yet these same holidays are also holidays that celebrate our history. Now, our history is one of divine providence, divine intervention, the miracles that God did and take us out of Egypt. And then Sukkot is commemorating the Exodus because when God took us out of Egypt, he placed us in huts. In other words, it's a completely different theme. It's nothing to do with nature. It's the opposite of nature. It's a divine intervention. It's divine providence. That's what we're celebrating through Passover. So now any given holiday, why do we celebrate Passover? We celebrate nature. We celebrate the harvest. We celebrate the agricultural cycle. And we celebrate the divine intervention, our history, which is all one story of divine intervention. So it's two separate themes. But not only is it two separate themes, it's two opposite themes, because seemingly, because nature is nature. You don't see the, the divine hand in nature. And then, the, and the, and then um, the, the historic part of the holiday, historic cycle, the stories of our history, that there you see divine intervention. So why can't we have double the holidays? Let's have agricultural holidays and let's have historic holidays. Why do we have the same holiday as a historic holiday and an agricultural holiday? So the answer is, well, it can be many answers, but one answer is maybe that's the whole purpose of the holidays. In other words, what Judaism is telling you, what we're celebrating is that nature is not distinct and separate from God. When the earth gives us its produce, it's not nature gave us its produce, which just we figured out how to how to um, use nature's power and how to control nature how to manipulate nature's power to give us what we need. But really, it's just nature, just random. No, we understand that nature is the same, comes from the same place as the histor historical side of the holidays as divine intervention. Nature itself is an expression of the divine intervention. So the blessings that we get through nature is really a blessing that we get through God. It's just hidden through the garments of nature. In other words, part of the whole theme of the holiday is that both the natural and the supernatural and the history and the divine intervention in our history, they both, it both comes from the same source. They both come from God because nature itself is an expression of God's uh, providence, of God giving us what we need. And maybe that's the deeper celebration. Yes, every agricultural society celebrated nature, but we celebrate, then we say nature is the gifts that God gives us through nature. And it's the same holiday, the same time that we celebrate the historic event, because the historic event, it's clear that it comes from um, Hashem's God's blessing. And both sources of celebration are intertwined because they both come from the same source. So this, ladies and gentlemen, is the story in short. Thank you for joining. Uh, didn't have much time to cover much of the parsha. We did a lot about the holidays, so it should be a joyous day, I guess. Thank you for joining, and uh, see each other.